So today I'm going to take you behind the scenes and through the research to solve this 50 year old mystery. Uh, before I start, there's just a couple of things I want to say. Uh, the first one is um, I will be obviously talking about real people in this presentation because it was a television show. Everybody um, has given their consent to being filmed on television and being used in publicity about the stories. People who have not given consent, such as matches that um, I will take you through uh, on the DNA, I have blurred out their names to keep their privacy. Uh, the second thing I want to say before starting is that being a genealogist and researcher for television is a little bit different from being a genealogist for a paying client. My client is the television production company, in this case Warners, and my contract with them states I have to keep everything confidential and cannot tell anybody about the story or the episode until it goes to air. This has ramifications about contacting matches and when you can actually reveal uh, and ask people from, for help. But um, we'll come on to this uh, in the story, but it's everything that has to be taken uh, into um, sort of um, context and uh, does have implications. So on the 11th of July in 1962, um, a milkman was on his rounds, a milkman called Trevor was on his rounds very early in the morning in Palmerston North. Um, as he was walking down the road, he thought he heard a cat meowing. But the closer he got to the phone box on the corner, he realized it was actually a baby crying. Trevor contacted the police and the little baby was taken to Palmerston North Hospital and he was nicknamed um, Bobby by the nurses. Um, Bobby was deemed to be between 10 and 20 days old. He was in excellent health, so he had been well looked after. In his basket was a change of nappies and also a bottle. The police examined his good quality clothing. They sent the clothing and a lock of Bobby's hair off to the DSIR in Wellington for testing and they started their inquiries. They um, spoke to everybody who had used that phone box the day that Bobby was found. They um, checked every baby that was registered in the three week period prior to the baby being left, uh, that these people had babies at home and hadn't abandoned their baby. They did house to house inquiries, but after six months in December 1962, the police had to um, close the case. They had had no success in whatsoever in locating information about Bobby's parents. Bobby was subsequently adopted by the Mitchell family in 1963. In 2008, Keith Mitchell's story went nationwide on an episode of 2020, where they reenacted the story of the baby in the phone box as Keith really wanted answers as to who his parents were. Unfortunately for Keith, no further evidence was uncovered, even though one lady came forward for DNA testing, uh, she was not a relative of Keith's. In 2019, we contacted Keith to see if we could help him. It was a story that I'd heard about and one that we were interested in. And we thought it would make a great episode with David Lomas. And so um, Keith um, agreed. Keith took an Ancestry DNA test 
and uh, with his, when his results came in, it was the first bit of information that Keith had about who he was. He was just a blank piece of paper. Being a foundling, he didn't have an adoption file. He knew absolutely nothing. So um, we were able to share with him that he was basically of British sort of stock and, uh, and a typical British emigrant family to New Zealand. And he had a community of um, Cook Strait um, settlers in his um, ethnicity. And as we can see, um, Palmerston North is uh, just about round here. So this is just a screen um, that you get when you go on to Ancestry. This is my DNA match screen, which is blank because uh, I've hidden everything. But um, there are some tools that Ancestry give us, which we often don't use because we're so keen to get on to who our matches are. And um, I think the map is a, a very good tool which is underutilized. So if you click on the map for Keith, this shows where all of Keith's DNA matches came from. And they very much um, show the patterns of migration from um, British settlers to Canada, to America, to Australia and to New Zealand. Um, although we've got a lady up in here who is a match and um, one day I will contact her just to find out where she fits into Keith's family. Um, if you were live on your screen and you clicked on the this is the 11 matches in New Zealand. This number is of a few weeks ago when I did the screen and reflects the fact that we tested a number of people to find Keith's family. If I was to click on this button here, it would actually reveal where people were living and will give their initials or a photo of your match so you can help locate living people if you need to. So I think this is an underutilized screen. Okay, we then get into Keith's matches. Keith had 22 second or third cousin matches. I've just um, tried to give a bit of privacy to these matches. So um, we're not saying exactly who they are because they don't know I'm doing this. I have not asked their permission or been in contact with them. So his strongest match is 600 centimorgans, which is amazingly high. Um, I should point out that when Keith first, we first got his results back, his highest match was actually at 254 centimorgans. Two months later, after the Christmas gift testers had come through, the two top matches showed up. So um, I was very relieved. It's much easier to solve a 600 centimorgan match than a 254 one. Okay, so we know our matches. Okay, what I do with shared matches is I sort by the leads method into clusters to identify matches at the grandparent level. I, um, I don't upload any of our tests to other sites such as MyHeritage or GEDmatch um, for the simple reason I am trying to keep confidential the fact that I'm working on this and I do not want people making contact or asking questions when I'm trying to um, keep things on the down low. Um, for those that don't know the Leeds method, Dana Leeds and Fiona Brooker have detailed instructions on their websites. Uh, it's danaleeds.com and Fiona is at memoriesintime.co.nz. If you're unfamiliar or you're only just learning Leeds, I would use, I would go to their websites as they are brilliant sites to use. 
So this is a chart I prepared earlier. Um, I use Excel spreadsheets to do my work. Um, I like Excel and it's just, I find it easy. So on, on the left hand column, I type in the names of all of my matches. The second column, the Centimorgan match. And the third column, whether they have trees, N for no, Y for yes, U for unlinked and L for locked. And I then start sorting to get my clusters. And so I've, you know, I work down until I come to a blank here and then I start M Fleming, who did they share with and choose another color and mark them in and so forth right the way down the page. Um, looking at my leads method chart, I do have a little bit of overlap. I have overlap between columns one and five and columns one and three. Um, getting a bit of overlap, I would expect to. Uh, if there was an awful lot, could be pedigree collapse or a few other things, but um, I'm quite happy with my distinct clusters at this stage. So what I do is I work through each cluster one at a time. So I start with my purple cluster as it's the strongest matches. And I look at their location on the map. I then check out their ethnicity and then I'll look at the relationship to Keith. Um, T Brewer is my top match and what it strikes me straight away is I've got 21% Polynesia here as opposed to Keith who's basically 100% sort of English British stock. Um, I know that T Brewer lives in New Plymouth in New Zealand from the map location and so I then go and look at the relationship. I use DNA Painter uh, to help me with my relationships as I love their charts um, so I can help figure out the relationship with people. So it's a matter of typing the Centimorgan into the box, hitting enter and it's coming up with a range of relationships that Kim is, uh, sorry, that um, Keith is to T Brewer. And this is everything from great great aunts and uncles through to a first cousin. Um, I don't know enough about my match to be able to answer this. It's a bit of information to um, acknowledge and move on to the next one and start building up. So I go back to my second match, which is K Brewer. Again, I notice straight away that I've got 22% Polynesia. Um, the map tells me that Cabrewer lives in Queensland and Cabrewer has a tree, which is great because T Brewer doesn't. And, but I'm, I want to do a little bit of investigating before I look at trees um, about this area here. So, on Facebook, I find my K Brewer in Queensland and it tells me that K Brewer has a sister, uh, which is T Brewer, uh, because K Brewer came from New Plymouth. By looking at the posts and the photos, I'm able to determine that K Brewer and T Brewer were born in the mid to late 1970s in New Plymouth. So um, I know with this high Centimorgan match that they're connected to Keith, but with this Polynesian, I know that I'm able to eliminate at least one of their branches as being connected to Keith because he has no um, Polynesia in his ethnicity. So my next step, so I've worked all the way down my purple clusters. I've done that for each and every one of them. I'm going to start building quick and dirty trees. 
I do this by looking at all, as, all of the online trees of cluster one so that I can try and work out who the most recent common ancestor is. I build my quick and dirty trees on paper. Uh, I use graph paper usually, or you can use readily available forms to download. Why do I do it this way and not online? I'm trying to keep everything private. I don't want the risk of someone, of me forgetting to set the privacy levels. And because I'm working probably 20 stories at a time, for me to be able to remember one tree from another tree, I find if I write it down and physically do it rather than build with an online program, I remember my detail more easily and I can keep all of my things in neat little folders so that if David wants to have a look at anything, it's all there for him to look at. So there are six batches in cluster one with trees. Some are small, some are unlinked, um, but I can amend and extend these trees using the Ancestry Public Tree Facility. So I hope you all use this. If you go to your Ancestry screen and click search, if you go down to Public Members Trees, you're able to um, find people and build out trees because not everybody who Keith is a match to has a decent tree, but I've got enough little trees to help me build them further using people who have the brewer, in this case, family in their line. So looking here at Violet Brewer, this person's tree doesn't go back far enough but using public member trees, I'm able to build back two more generations for Violet. So I just print off their tree and then start adding and scribbling all over it to try and find my most recent common ancestor. And also to pick up mistakes that other people make where they've just copied someone else's tree and, uh, and um, got it wrong. So by the time I'd completed and looked at all of those trees, my most recent common ancestor for Keith was actually a lot further back than I'd thought. It was actually at the great, great grandparent level by the time I'd gone through all of the trees available. This couple were living in Tasmania, but I managed to find them coming to New Zealand. So unusual names. I've got Henry Clayton Brewer and Rosamond Mary Ann Haggart. Uh, always nice when you're working with uncommon names. So what I do then is I build the tree forward, again using public trees on Ancestry to help me, but I now bring in the uh, New Zealand DIA site for historic marriages, births and deaths. I use the New Zealand Marriage CD. I use microfiche at the library forever, trying to find births, marriages, and deaths. I use Archway and I use Family Search to check for wills to get more information about family groups. I then, at this stage, go back to look at the names. I'm looking for common names and surnames of people who have taken DNA tests because Keith doesn't know anything about family. I don't know who I'm looking for, but can I see patterns in names? So I revisit my clusters, all of them, and I find five common names that appear frequently. Brewer, Fleming, Cotter, Clayton and Haggart. Much nicer than having Smith, Jones um, and common names. So I've got some good names to work with. I then go back to my quick and dirty tree and we have Frederick Brewer marrying a Margaret Cotter. This 
couple had seven children. And if I skip to the bottom, I don't know if you can read this on my screen, but son Howard Brewer married Rangi. This is our Polynesian branch. And I can ignore this when looking for Keith, but I bear it in mind because my two strongest DNA matches come from this branch. So thinking of those common names, Clayton is a middle name in many of these children. I've got Marion Clayton Brewer, Lillian Clayton Brewer, Elizabeth Clayton Brewer, Howard Clayton Brewer. I've got one Haggett appearing here as a middle name. And I've got one Fleming. Now my Fleming is a marriage of Henry Brewer to Francis Fleming. I think this is my intersect with two clusters coming together. So I'm going to make a hypothesis. So in my hypothesis, I've simplified my tree. I've got Frederick marrying Margaret Brewer, marrying Margaret Cotter. I've put in my Howard and Rangi because I want to show my T Brewer and K Brewer matches here. So I can think about the relationship between Keith and these two strongest matches. I have Henry Brewer marrying Francis Fleming. My hypothesis is that one of their children is a parent of Keith. I don't know if it's the father of Keith, I don't know if it's the mother of Keith, but one of these people here would give me the right relationship to T Brewer and K Brewer, and it ties in my cluster of Flemings with my cluster of Brewers. So, how can I find out about these people? Given that Keith was born in 1962, I know the parents are going to be born earlier. So they're going to be born in the 40s or the, yeah, 40s or early 50s. I'm not quite sure. Depends. Um, no, it'll be in the 40s. I can't get that information because they might be living on anybody's public tree. They'll have them private. I can't get this information from birth microfiche at the library because prior to 1960, there are no indicators as to who the mother was. After 1960, the mother's Christian name is on the birth index. So I need to look elsewhere to find these people. So fortunately from my research, I know Francis Fleming died young and fortunately Francis Fleming, now Brewer, left a will and I can access the will. This will identifies not only the names of her children and this is a public available document, it also gives me their ages when Francis died in 1955. So I can eliminate, I believe, Joyce from being a mother of Keith because she would have been too young, I believe. But, you know, it's any one of these I'm looking at. So I now need to go and find these people. And I've got tools to do that. My favorite tool, particularly for finding older people, is Terranet. Terranet is a property website in New Zealand. If you own a property, it will be listed on Terranet. You can um, make an account at Terranet for nothing. It doesn't cost anything. It only costs money if you want to print out who owns a title of a property to get the the partner's name or you want a little bit more information about when they were living at an address if it's an old address. So I start using Terranet. I find one son Terence in Geraldine. 
I can't find son Leslie, but I know he has a son called Darcy from my research that I've done, and I find an address on Terranet for him. Son Frederick, unfortunately, is dead. He died unmarried, but it doesn't rule him out from being Keith's father. It just means I've got nobody to test from his line. A search on Facebook for Colleen reveals that she passed away in 2018, but she had a son, Beau. As I couldn't find a marriage for Colleen, I've now got her down as a major possibility. Did she have an earlier son prior to Beau? Because she doesn't seem to have married. It's a possibility, but it's all conjecture. And I find an address for Bo on Terranet. So I'm at the exciting but nervous stage in my research. I need to write to them all and ask them if they will do a DNA test. I would never ring someone up and ask them to do a DNA test. You're taking people by surprise. I need to give them a lot of information. I need, I'm only going to get one chance at it, so I always write a letter. I will read the letter out that I wrote uh, shortly, but you get one chance at this, so make sure it's perfect. Keep the content short so it fits on one page. Keep it simple. Don't use any technical jargon. These people might not even be into genealogy, let alone um, DNA. So it's so easy to confuse people and make it in the too hard basket. Be honest, but don't scare them off. I always send a kit at the same time. And because I'm for television, I actually will need to tell them in my letter that I'm a television researcher. I need to give them all the necessary approvals to save time. So if, you know, if I found Keith's dad, I might want him to be on telly to do a reunion. So let's get it all done at once and always include a return paid career to make it easy for them. Okay, the letter. So I'll read this out because it might be too hard. So dear, I apologize for writing to you out of the blue, but I'm hoping you can help solve a 50 year old mystery. I am a researcher for a TV series, David Lomas Investigates with David Lomas, that helps people find family and solve mysteries. Keith was adopted in 1963, but has no knowledge of his birth family. He has taken a DNA test and we know that his great grandparents are Frederick Babington Brewer and Margaret Shaw Cotter. I am contacting descendants of this couple to ask if they would be willing to take a DNA test to help us identify his parents. I believe you are a descendant of this couple. So I haven't said take a DNA test, I think you're Keith's dad. I haven't said Keith was abandoned in a phone box, but I've been truthful. Keith was adopted in 1963 and has no knowledge of his birth father. And he is, a, um, Frederick Brewer and Margaret Cotter are his great grandparents. Uh, and I am contacting other descendants of the couple. So I then say I've enclosed a DNA kit, consent forms and reply paid courier pack to send the completed kit and documentation back to me. I need them to sign the consent form so that I can um, involve them in TV. And if they were to just post the kit back to Ancestry, I don't know when they sent it. I would then not have any consent forms. So I ask for everything to come back to me so that I can then send them off. I then say, if you would prefer not to take a DNA test, I completely understand and just request you return the unopened test kit back to me. 
I am happy to answer any questions you may have by email or on the phone. I do hope you can help Keith with this mystery and thank you for your consideration. So imagine receiving such a letter, it is out of the blue, but hopefully I've given them enough information for them to make an informed decision and I have not misled anyone. So how did the letter go down and what happened? Terence returned his completed kit and paperwork and included in the kit was a handwritten letter telling me he didn't have a computer, he didn't know much about his family history, but he had spoken to his younger sister Joyce. He was the family historian and he gave me her contact details should I wish to know anything further about the family. And he asked that I share results with him and with Joyce. Darcy returned his completed kit and paperwork that same week. But I heard nothing from Bo. And nothing, and nothing. So a week later, I contacted Joyce and I was so pleased that Terence had given me her contact details as Joyce had become a Joyce Smith. Joyce had told me that Bo was moving home and she would contact him. Bo's kit arrived a few days later. So I had a 100% response positive rate from that letter. And my experience is that letter usually gets me between a 80 to 100% response every time I send it out. So it seems to work. So at this stage, everything is sent off to Ancestry and I start playing the waiting game, nervously waiting for the um, replies to come back from Ancestry with the answers because David is getting impatient and wants to go filming because that's what he likes doing and he wants to talk to people. But at the moment, he can't do anything until it's solved. The first test back is Terence. Terence comes in at a close family and he is actually Keith's uncle. Darcy's results come three days later and unfortunately his DNA sample was corrupted and I have to go back and ask for another sample. Darcy says no the second time. Uh, I then start imagining all sorts of things that Darcy um, has remembered something about 1963 and doesn't want to do a DNA test and doesn't want to know. But three days later, I get Bo's result in and Bo, real name Harry Francis Brewer, comes up as a full sibling match. So Bo is Keith's brother. This is a result that I had not expected, not expected in a million years that I would find a full sibling. So what did we do once we had this? So David went to meet with Bo to discuss the results of his DNA test. David took our cameraman Graham with him, but offered to meet with Bo in private to discuss the results and not film. But Bo said, no, I'm happy to be filmed. I'm really interested to know what you have to tell me. Bo was actually worried that he was the father of someone else's child. He didn't sort of know what we were going to tell him really. Um, he was obviously quite shocked to find he had a full brother. Um, Bo did not know who his own father was as there is no father's name on his birth certificate. Bo had been raised by his mother Colleen and his uncle Brian. David then went to meet with Joyce, Colleen's younger sister, 
to ask questions about Colleen and Uncle Brian. Joyce then told David that Colleen and Brian, to all intents and purposes, were just um, family members living together, but they had been in love for uh, since Joyce was a young girl of 16, and which was why her parents made Colleen and Brian leave the family farm, and that um, they had had uh, obviously fathered Beau, and Joyce believed that um, it was possible that Colleen uh, and Brian were Keith's parents, but told David to go and see Colleen's best friend. So David went and met with Kathy Roder. Kathy had been Colleen's best friend at the time she was pregnant, and it transpired Kathy had kept the secret of the phone box baby all this time, nearly 50 years. Um, Kathy shared with David that Colleen was worried that how her relationship with Brian would be perceived by people if they kept a baby. Um, that while it was illegal for Colleen and Brian, we know today that they couldn't marry, it wasn't illegal for them to have a relationship. It's not incest. But they didn't know that. We're talking about the early 1960s. You couldn't Google things back then. So, you know, if you didn't know something, you were worried. You, you felt you were in the wrong. Kathy said that um, Colleen and Brian stayed in the car next to the phone box, hugging each other and crying and waiting until their baby was found before leaving the scene. Um, Kathy also said that Colleen had a photo of her baby and basically the photo she kept with her all the time in her wallet until it got to a stage where it disintegrated because it had been handled and, and, and looked at so often and that, you know, Colleen and Brian had really loved their baby and um, we also learned that um, there had been another baby prior to Keith. So DNA in conjunction with the information from all of the record sources we needed to use and talking to the family solved the mystery of the phone box baby. Keith had the answers to his questions. He had a newfound family. Um, I could not believe when we were at the reunion how similar Bo and Keith were. Um, they had so much in common. They had undertaken the same jobs throughout their lives. They had a similar, they, they each had a daughter that looked like each other and their two daughters became instant best friends. Um, Keith and Bo um, and the whole family are still very close. Keith also knows he has another brother out there somewhere. But most importantly for Keith, he knows he was loved and he knows that Colleen and Brian didn't abandon him because they didn't love him. They abandoned him because they didn't feel that they could keep him because of society's pressure and they felt they were doing the best thing for Keith. So thank you for listening and um, I'm sure I couldn't show you the episode but um, it is a very moving episode and I was very grateful to have met Keith and his wonderful family and, um, and his extended family and how open and welcoming Joyce was to the whole process. So any questions? Thank you, Gail. That was excellent. <laughs> I've got uh, 
uh, I've got a few tears <laughs> in the back of my eyes. I remembering the program. Yes. Um, and uh, and Penny has got something in her eye. Um, and so I've got a couple of questions yes. coming through for you. Um, so I will read them to you. Um, somebody wanted to know, uh, Joe wanted to know, how long did it take from start to finish? Okay. Um, probably four months. So from getting um, Keith's DNA results back to um, David sitting down with Bo and starting filming, it was four months. Oh, wow, that was really quick. That was quick. Wow. <laughs> it's, um, I, I have to solve so many stories that we can't start filming until I've solved them. Um, and so um, I have to work quickly. And, yeah. and, um, and it's one of those things when every genealogist knows once you get on a roll, you can't stop. So <laughs> just because it's going home time in the office at 5.30, I would go home and still work on it. So mm -hmm. I would be working at night going through DNA matches, just trying to make the connection, spending a long time looking and building trees. So, um, but four months is relatively quick. Mm, gosh. Um, Kelly wants to know, how did you get into becoming a professional genealogist and researcher? Okay. Um, well, my, it would have been 35 years ago, I think. Um, I had family mysteries of my own. And I started off by wanting to solve my own mysteries. Um, and I had to wait until my mother passed away because she wouldn't talk about her family. And I enrolled with the um, National Institute of Genealogical Studies, which is based out of Toronto University. Mm -hmm. And I started taking papers. And after 40 papers, I had a qualification and I just, I've done about 65 papers. It became an addiction. Mm -hmm. um, my background is in television production. And I was lucky enough to be working at Warner Brothers on an other on program funding and other shows. And David was working for the same company doing his programs. And he got to find out that I was a qualified genealogist. And I started helping him on cases. And six, seven years ago, I work, went to work with David full time. Um, Julia wants to know what are the reasons you use Ancestry over other websites? Yep, um, they've got a larger database, uh, fish where the fishes are. Um, yep. There's, I think, is it 16 million in Ancestry, um, 6 million in my heritage. Um, so I go where the biggest database is, and Ancestry give me kits for free and they fast track me and um, so eve wants to know please can you advise which databases to use for searching searching for maori um i use electoral rolls i use maori um land online um i go to um if i know iwi or something like that we we talk to people um they have very good oral histories and knowledge, and uh, we usually do it that way. So David's very good at getting information out of people. Mm. So um, if we've got a distant cousin, they usually help us make contact. So there aren't that many databases available, mm. um, particularly when you're looking for living people. But yeah. Ellen was just saying, thank goodness times have changed. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank goodness people don't have to do that with their children anymore. No, and it's like, you know, it wasn't that long ago where, you know, women had no option but to give children up for adoption if families wouldn't help them. There was no benefits. And, you know, the Bethany homes were where people went to. So. Mm. 
Okay, well, I think that's probably about it for now. Um, thank you so much, Gail. 